another Tuesday, beautiful day, beautiful weather, great scripture we're going to be studying today. I hope everybody can hear me, and uh, I'm coming through loud and uh, clear. So welcome. Welcome to our Bible study. I am glad that you could join us today. We're going to be taking a close look at the first half of the fourth chapter of Ephesians, which is a call for unity within the church. Uh, so our format is one, we will begin with worship. We will have prayer, study, and then comments and questions. And as usual, please feel free to type any questions or comments or scriptures or encouragements that you have into the window here in the Bible study text channel. So let's begin with worship. I uh, came across this group um, that uh, I really like their sound. They just have beautiful harmony. And um, I think in this day and time, we need the encouragement of the Lord Jesus Christ that in this song, we need to agree with what is being sung here, that we know who holds tomorrow. We know who holds tomorrow. We know who is sovereign and who has all things in his perfect timing and in his hands. So let's listen to this together. When you're done, uh, just type done into the box. I don't know about tomorrow I just live from day to day And I don't borrow from the sunshine For its skies may turn to gray And I don't know
I don't know about you, but that's a beautiful song. And I love uh, just the tight harmonies and, and the message of that song. You know, I had the privilege to sit down today uh, when my grandchildren come over. We uh, sit with them every Tuesday and Thursday so that uh, mom can go to work. And uh, we start our day with the devotional. And today I was able to share with them the the aspect that that Christ is reigning that that He announced at the end of His life that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and and we can rest assured that He is on the throne, that He is working things out, no matter what we see or feel or hear or sense. Even when we read the news, we have to understand that Christ is in control that he holds tomorrow and i was thinking about the uh the the song the solid rock the last verse is when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne what a privilege to know that christ is in us and we are in him Well, let's start with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your truth. Your word is truth. And Father, we ask you to sanctify us in that truth, that we may know you, that we may serve you, that we may love you, that we may glorify you in all that we do and all that we say. And even the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing to you. And yes, we know, we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't even know from one day to another, but we do know who has all authority and all power and all wisdom and all might. And we worship you, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you are ruling and you are reigning on the throne even now. Speak to us through your word in Jesus name, amen. Amen. So I I read a story about a man that was visiting his friends and, and both of his friends in this story were rock collectors. And so he decided to ask them, he said, do you believe that the rock formations reveal a very old earth? And the wife answered first saying that she thinks the earth is relatively young. The husband on the other hand said that You know, I believe there is evidence that the earth is much older than many claim. Before leaving, the man said, you know, you've taught me something about the way Christians should deal with disagreement. You've been married for 30 years. You're still in love with each other. And above all, you both love the Lord. Yet you differ on when God created the earth. Your differences have not destroyed your devotion to Christ and your love for one another, that's how it should be with Christians on debatable matters. And this is what Paul, when we come to the book of Ephesians, Paul's plea for walking in unity does not suggest that believers will see eye to eye on every issue. What he does encourage, however, is an honest effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You know, Christians, as believers, we share in one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father. And when this unity is coupled with humility, gentleness, long-suffering, and long-forbearance, debatable issues are not likely to become divisive. Although we often feel the urge to prove a point to others, we must respect divergent views expressed by Christian family members. Our union with Christ is the basic basis for unity with one another. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, let me put it here for you. For as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. 
members of one another. So here is the context of the book to the Ephesians. Let me give a quick overview. In chapters one through three, Paul has outlined the blessings associated with being a child of God. Now he goes on beginning in chapter four, he's going to outline now what is our responsibilities associated with that status. Notice that the indicative in other words, what, what Christ has already accomplished, what he has already called us to be, begins first and comes before the imperative. In other words, he tells us who he is and what he has done in us and who we are in Christ Jesus. And then by doing that, he enables us to keep the commands. He gives the imperative. Verses 1 through 16 uh, in this chapter, set the tone for the rest of the letter. Let me just uh, put in the first three verses. So Paul begins chapter four in this manner. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. He starts out a prisoner in the Lord, okay? Earlier, Paul had mentioned being the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. That was in chapter three. Paul was imprisoned on several occasions, initially in Philippi by the high priest and the Sadducees, but later at the instigation of the Jews by the Romans. The Romans took him through Caesarea to Rome and this letter, Paul will describe himself as an ambassador in chains. So Paul is writing the Ephesians to the Ephesians from his imprisonment in Rome. So he is literally and figurative, figuratively a prisoner of the Lord. And he calls him to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you have been called. This is really the central theme of the rest of the letter. This is an appeal. Let us live up to the high calling to which God has called them. Now, this word calling in the Greek means a call or an invitation. The New Testament uses this word to speak of God's invitation to become a member of the kingdom of God, to be adopted into God's family. In other words, to gain salvation and the hope of the eternal. So what Paul is saying is now, having been invited by God to this high calling, now walk in a manner worthy of that calling, okay? It's interesting that both the Old Testament and the New Testament uses the word walk as we would use the word to live. In other words, Paul is pleading with these Christians to live their lives according to their godly calling. What would it entail to walk in a manner worthy of the calling? Well, Jesus gives an excellent example, and we find that in Matthew chapter 22. He said to them, this is Jesus speaking, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That's walking in a manner worthy of the calling. We love God first and we love others. Jesus first, others next. Because we love the Lord Jesus, because we love him and we desire to keep his commandments, one of his commandments is to love our neighbor. And then he goes on to say, how do we do this? With all humility. So humility, or as in other translations, it uses the word lowliness, is not often seen as a virtue today. We, we tend to prize assertiveness rather than humility. However, as believers, we are called to emulate Christ, who, according to Philippians, 
though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. So our first characteristic that we emulate is humility and his commandment. Amen. Thank you, Psalmist. That is his commandment, that it, we believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. The second quality that Paul mentions is gentleness. Gentleness is the kind of graceful spirit that comes from a deep faith that God is good and will prevail in the end. That's what our song was about tonight. That's what our worship was about. We know that God is good, that his character is good, that everything he does is good, and he will prevail in the end. We might talk about such a person as being a strong, quiet type. That's gentleness, gentleness. The third characteristic he speaks about is patience. The word patience suggests an endurance or a steadfastness rather than just a passive, we're just kind of waiting for something to happen. It withstands adversity without quitting. It endures opposition without striking out at the opponent or at least without striking out too quickly or too violently. violently. It possesses the strength of a rock steadiness because we are standing on the rock, we can be with that solid rock. Next, he talks about bearing with one another in love, bearing with one another in love. Uh, bearing means to endure, to exercise patience or restraint. Every relationship requires bearing, enduring, and exercising patience or restraints. That is true in marriages. It is true in churches and it is true in friendships and it's true in a working environment. As my wife always likes to say, you know, when you get married, it's two sinners coming together. And that's what we are. We are two sinners coming together and we bear with one another and we learn to walk in forgiveness and in grace. Um, oh, good one, violinist. Uh, let me think about that. <laughs> yes, in chat rooms, we bear with one another. Um, uh, it would have to be love because I think love joins all of them together. Uh, love, joy, peace, they, they all come together. Uh, let me give a uh, disclaimer here. This is a, a quorum note. I'm not suggesting here that people bear with one another in every circumstance. In other words, parents should not bear unacceptable behavior by their children. Victims of spousal or child abuse will, not need, will need to, must escape from the situation when, da da when danger dictates that. I'm not suggesting we bear up under that. When dealing with an alcoholic or drug addict, bearing with one another often becomes codependency and enabling behavior. Alcoholics and drug addicts don't need enablers. We need to escape from that. They need people to confront them and to demand change. That is not bearing up under. Okay, there's a difference there. And we have to be careful of that difference. Okay. But even when dealing with unacceptable behavior, we can act in agape love. There, is, there must be a concern for the well-being of that other person who is hurting and wanting to hurt people. That might involve tough love, setting standards, uh, refusing support until the person meets those standards, but there is no requirement for agape love to be soft and cuddly on all occasions, not when you are suffering at the hands of another. That is not bearing with one another. I hope I made that clear. Boundaries, amen, Lily, boundaries. And, and absolutely, Shalom. Enabling is usurping God's place. We, we are not to be enablers, enablers to enable bad behavior, especially when it can harm us or others. Notice that he says, eager to maintain 
the unity of the spirit in the mind of peace. He doesn't say eager to create unity. Obviously, he's speaking from a position that we already are unified and we need to maintain that unity. Why are we already uni unified? Well, Jesus prayed for that in uh, John chapter 17 in his great uh, pastoral prayer. He prayed that they may be one as you and I are one. What closer fellowship can we have than the son had with the father that we would be one as he is with the father? He prayed for that and continues to pray for that. So we need to maintain the unity, that lowliness, humility, patience, and love that Paul urged in verse two will make it possible to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So that unity has already been granted and established through the breaking down of the dividing walls that we talked about in chapter two. It is because we are one in Christ, united to him in his baptism, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. So peace and unity are there. It is our calling to maintain the peace and unity. And who makes this possible? It is the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Spirit of God that makes unity possible. He says in 1 Corinthians 12, let me quote that, this here. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether bond or free, and we're all given to drink into one spirit. There are many members, but one body. So here in, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church, Paul is talking about the, the diversity of members in the body of Christ. And he likened that diversity of the church to our physical bodies, which have hands and feet and ears and eyes. We can imagine what life would be like uh, if these body parts were at war with each other. We wouldn't be able to accomplish even the smallest task, walking in a straight line or preparing a sandwich. It would be a miserable existence. So also in the church, disunity equates to dysfunction. But unity in the, in the church doesn't come easily. We must rely on the spirit to maintain it, working together harmoniously, how Paul tells us, in the bond of peace. And he goes on to say, verses uh, four through six, there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One body. The key word here is one. The body mentioned here is the church. Now, if you're reading these verses aloud, you'll notice where I place the emphasis. I didn't say one body, one spirit, one Lord. I said one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The emphasis is not on the diversity of gifts, but the fact that all believers share these gifts. And they are given to the church for the edification of the body. And he goes on to say, Paul says, who is over all and through all and in all, the foundational a uh, creed for Israel is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one, and you shall love Yahweh, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This is the key to our unity. We believers might see things differently, but we have one godly Father whom we worship and who directs our lives. The all in this verse, in its original context, would have meant Jews and Gentiles. But in our world today, all means all, means black and brown and white, Asian, Indian, American. However, it could, it could not mean all people, but all believers. Why? Because believers are the only ones that are united in Christ. We are in him and he is in us. Okay, make sense? 
Okay, let's look at the next few verses here. Uh, this is uh, verses 7 through 10. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So in verses four through six, Paul emphasized our unity. Now he acknowledges our diversity. The grace given to each of us is a distinctive grace that is made to measure just as a custom tailored suit is made to measure. We have each been given gifts. Our gifts have been given for the benefit for the, for the church. Yes, the uh, Tetragrammaton. Maybe we need to study that one time. I think Shalom probably has some good insight on that too, is the, uh, is the YHWH because there were no uh, vowels in, in the language, or, or at least they did not write vowels in that instance. So Paul here is speaking of a diversity of gifts. Why does God give a diversity of gifts? It's all for the benefit of the church to benefit the church for the building up of the saints until they all come to faith and to all to unity. Paul writes again in Romans 12, for as in one body, we have many members and the members do not have all the same function. Okay, there's, there's your unity in diversity. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. We all, in our unity, all believers, share the grace of salvation through faith. But each Christian is also given some particular gift of grace to benefit, to build up the church. And then he goes on to say, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives. He gave gifts to men. Here Paul is quoting Psalm 68, verse 18. Uh, which says, you ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts of Hmong men. In its original context, this psalm celebrated a victory over God's enemies and a triumphal procession bringing the spoils of victory, including the prisoners, up Mount Zion to the temple. That was the dwelling place of God. I think I got it. <laughs> okay, we're back online. Okay, um, had to mute a mic real quick. Uh, so, so this is this is a picture of a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. They would ascend to the temple, bringing the bringing the, the spoils of their victory behind them, bringing the prisoners up to the dwelling place of God. Paul relates this verse to Christ who ascended on high. He led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So now Paul uses this imagery to picture Christ's triumphal procession with freed prisoners in tow. Think of it. We're part of that procession. We are freed prisoners. We are free in Christ Jesus. Paul told the Roman church, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. That's the sort of thing that this Ephesian verse celebrates. We are celebrating our freedom and our freedom to use our gifts that God has gifted us with for his glory and for the building up of the church. So earlier, Paul had said, and this is uh, from Ephesians 1, chapter uh, verse 20, uh, Paul gives a little bit more detail about this ascension. 
Um, he says in verses one, tw- uh, in chapter one, twenty through twenty three, that uh, that God raised him, meaning Christ, from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things, the church, which his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Christ came to this exalted position. He now enjoys, he now enjoys through the humility, humiliation that he suffered on earth. This refers to his incarnation, his becoming flesh. When he took on human nature here in the lower regions, the earth, and this pattern of service is to be imitated by believers that we are to imitate the service that Christ came to the earth. He is the supreme head of the church. He fills all things with his glory, power, and sovereign prerogative to dispense gifts to his people. Christ has the power to fill all things, to meet all needs, to give each person the grace that they needed. While biblical references to the heavens sometimes refer to the sky above the earth, or to outer space, they more often refer to the heavens, meaning the dwelling place of God. The dwelling place of God. He goes on here to talk about these specific gifts that he gave to the saints. Let's look at uh, verses 11 and 12 here. The third heaven, yes. Thank you, Christ Walk. He goes on to, to name these. He gave apostles, prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up, the edification of the body of Christ. First apostles, in a restricted sense, these apostles were those who walked with Jesus during his earthly ministry and witnessed to his resurrection or received a special revelation of the risen Christ, as Paul did in Acts chapter 9. And these apostles were commissioned by Jesus to be the founders, the foundation, the building blocks of the church. The word was also used in a broader sense of people sent out as delegates uh, to particular churches uh, through, though these do not appear to be whom Paul has in mind uh, for this passage. Secondly, he mentions prophets. Okay. Um, pro- the New Testament prophets conveyed special revelation to the early church. Their functions included prediction, and, and I believe there was, I think it was Agabus that, that predicted a famine, an upcoming famine uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, they were there for exhortation, for encouragement, for warning, and for uh, explanation. A um, couple verses in Acts I'll give you to look up later. I won't try to post them here. Abacus, Abagus with a G. <laughs> Good one, violinist. Okay. The teaching of the New Testament prophets and apostles led to the foundation of the church. It says that the, the church is built on the foundations of the prophets and the apostles. Next, he mentions evangelists. Uh, these were people and our people today, especially gifted to proclaim the gospel. Evangelism, the preaching of Christ crucified, was at the core of Paul's apostolic calling. Although his office included greater authority to receive and transmit revelation from the Holy Spirit and to lead the church. Now I'm going to put the last two, and I believe in many ways these last two shepherds and teachers uh, go hand in hand. These two words may have, may go together to refer to a single set of individuals who both shepherd and instruct God's flock. Shepherding, shepherding in the sense that they are protecting and guarding the flock from people coming in and teaching in the sense of guarding from false teaching. On the other hand, two distinct but related offices may be in view. Teachers and other elders who provide spiritual oversight with less a focus on teaching. So there's a, a ruling in some denomination, and, and 
particularly in my denomination, we have elders. Uh, some churches separate those into ruling and teaching elders. We believe them to be one, that a, a ruling elder should also be able to teach. And he goes on to say, why? What is the purpose? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up the, of the body of Christ. So this word equip means to complete or to perfect or to make ready, to equip, complete, or to make ready. Um, lost my notes, lost my place. Sorry. Okay. So the work of the apostles, prophets, uh, et cetera, is for the purpose of preparing the saints for the lives that, that we are to live and the work that they or we are to do. And the term building up carries with it the understanding of the construction of a house, a tower or a barn. Uh, the work of the apostles, prophets, etc., was for the purpose of providing Christians a sturdy foundation and strong walls and a solid roof so that they might survive the storms that will buffet them and the temptations that will threaten them. Okay, you get the metaphor there. Uh, pretty good the way Paul terms it there, and we can kind of see what he's saying there. Okay, and then he goes on, verse 13. Until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue, stature of the fullness of Christ. In, in this context, faith has to do with doctrine the body of Christian doctrine. The purpose of Christian nurture is to school believers in the revealed truth so that they might be united in their beliefs. So the diversity of gifts serves to bring about unity of God's people. Mature manhood extends the body metaphor, metaphor used earlier for the church and contrast that with children that come in the next verse that's coming up. Some people think that the learning of doctrine is inherently devices. I'll give a, a story because uh, this was in a chat room. It wasn't this chat room and it's no, it's, it's somebody you don't know. Um, uh, the person said that they were totally against doctrine. Um, they, they don't, they think that doctrine divides. I said, and I just explained uh, very basically, uh, the word doctrine comes from doxa, which means simply teaching. I said, what do you believe about Jesus? Um, he said, well, Jesus is Lord. I said, that's doctrine. <laughs> You're quoting doctrine. When we say, we can't say Jesus is Lord unless we're quoting doctrine. Doctrine is simply teaching, and teaching is the truth of Scripture and drawing from Scripture what Scripture says about us, about God, about our world, about nature, about our future. We need to know doctrine. We need to have it. Mature manhood, uh, the church needs doctrine, and we need to guard. You know, people that say that we don't need doctrine, they are opening themselves up to fall for anything. And they will fit right in with the next verse. So very, very important that we, it's, it's not divisive. It is people who divide the church. Whereas the knowledge of the Son of God, both knowing Christ personally and understanding all that he did and taught, is edifying and brings about mature manhood. Doctrine doesn't divide. It edifies. It teaches. It guards us. So teach good, sound doctrine. And that word sound doctrine in many translations means healthy. Healthy doctrine is truth. So Christ Jesus is the standard of the maturity to which the church must aspire. Christ's fullness is the full expression of his divine and human perfection. So the goal of the Christian life is that we no longer be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of the spirit, that we would be transformed into the image of Christ by the renewing of the mind. And yes, it does offer good mental health. And then he goes on to say, so that, here's the so that, without doctrine, here's what you're going to be, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. 
without proper teaching, without proper doctrine, you're going to fall for anything. Immaturity in the truths of Christian doctrine makes the church like gullible children tossed helplessly by the waves and wind of cunning and deceitful schemes of false teachers. The goal of Christian nurture is, and the goal of gifts that God has given us through the church is that believers might grow into mature spiritual people and to ground us doctrinally so that we can stand our ground when others seek to derail us. Very important for us to understand doctrine. Well, let me finish with the last two verses, chapter, chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Rather, helps us through the storms of life, absolutely. I would not make it through many of the storms I've been through unless I had known and been taught and had faithful teachers who taught me. Goes on to say, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. First, we're to speak the truth in love. I hope that tonight I am speaking the truth to you in love teaching you how important learning and truth and, and your gift and your part in the body of Christ is. Truth spoken in love stands a chance of being heard, whereas truth spoken without love is almost certain to be rejected. One of the goals of Christian nurture is that we come to a point where we can speak the truth in love. The truth must never be used as a club to bludgeon people into acceptance and obedience, but always present the truth in love. The truth leads, leads Christians to maturity and is defined here as growing into Christ. We are to grow up in every way. Lowliness, the things I mentioned earlier, humility, patience, love, unity, peace. We are Christ's body and Christ is the head of the body. We need to grow until the body of Christ is in keeping with the head. And he goes on to say, that we are joined together, held together by every joint by which it is equipped. The individual parts are connected by joints or ligaments that make it possible for us to work together. And it's important for us to respect each individual member of the body of Christ. We need to ensure that each believer is enabled to con contribute according to the gifts given them, and that the multiplicity, the diversity of gifts are joined together to serve the whole. Every member, every member plays a crucial role in this growth in love. There's no Christian maturity or true Christian ministry without love. Read chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Every act of love in the name of Christ is valued and remembered by him. So each part is working properly. So in that manner, the church cannot grow strong if the individual members are not working in harmony. The only way we can do this is by acting in that agape love, love that focuses on the well-being of the other person, love that focuses on Christ and taking the focus off of us. That kind of love makes it possible for us to hold our tempers when things don't go our way and to maintain harmony, harmonious relationships, even with our opponents. It makes it possible for us to avoid selfish, self-destructive behaviors and to love the body of Christ. Let me say one more thing. We here at Four Gospel Networks, we have a, many wonderful, beautiful believers that I've met from all over the world, from various backgrounds, from various denominations. And you know, we differ in a lot of things. And, you know, I, I think about, I don't care if you believe that we're baptized by dunking or by sprinkling. I don't care if you believe in pre-trib, post-trib, or mid-trib. Uh, I, I, I don't care if you believe that uh, um, 
that only elders can serve communion or anybody can serve. I, what, what's your belief system? What I care about, I, 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 my prayer is that we set aside every minor secondary differences in doctrine, that we focus every day on our commonality. What is our commonality? We are united in Christ together as one body. No, we're not a church here. We're not a church. We, we are a, a, a group of people who love the Lord and we are learning to love one another. So let's do this. Let's set aside our differences and learn to love one another. Remember, Jesus prayed that they all may be one as he and the Father are one. May the Lord Christ himself make it so. Lord, we pray that you would make it so. Lord, make us one as you are one, that you would be glorified in this room, that this room would be used to glorify your name, to speak the gospel, to encourage one another, to love one another, to use our gifts to help one another grow. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to give you a little bit of homework an article to read, and we have a, uh, this is an excellent article I read this week on uh, the witness of the communion of the saints um, about the body of Christ, and I had a special request. Our request is from Shalom, and she asked that I play for you uh, Nothing But the Blood, and that's an old time yeah. hymn, uh, and this is what we're, that's, I'm going to play this for you. second song was Jesus paid it all. Uh, have a great evening. Sometime we're going to have to get violinist and I together to do a duet. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, that would be wonderful. Thank you for coming and I will be around. I'm going to go get some dinner now. Have a great evening. <laughs>